It is Tuesday, which of course means it's time to answer the questions that you guys send in every single week on the Brennan Place forums at brennanplace.com forward slash forums or in the YouTube comment section down below. Of course, you can download this episode and every other episode of Let's Talk Tuesdays on iTunes, Spreaker, and you can listen to the show also on Stitcher as well. And of course, YouTube, brennanplace.com, and uh, you can get it everywhere. So... Pretty big week in wrestling. We're coming off the money in the bank pay view. Of course, we had the uh, the tragic death of Dusty Rhodes as well. Um, plenty to talk about on Monday Night Raw, and we had the Brock Lesnar return as well. And we're building towards the Battleground pay view. Finally, we have actually a build up, four week build up. I mean, how many times have been clamoring on and um, I guess moaning and complaining about the lack of build up for the recent pay views? Well, finally, we have a four or five week build up for Battleground, so that's a bit of a relief. So that should be good. And I'm also going to talk about E3. So there's plenty to talk about on E3, and um, that should be that should take up quite a bit of the show. I want to actually talk a lot about E3 today. There's a lot of new games that uh, have, are on the horizon and looking to come out this year and next year, which I'm very, very excited about. So I'm going to talk about that today as well. Before we get into it all, though, I just want to give a quick shout-out to a friend of mine and a member of the Brennan Place forums. His name is Lunatic Ginge. I want to shout out his YouTube channel for all you guys to go and check it out. What he's been doing is he's going back on old pay-per-views. So at the moment, he's doing 2012 pay-per-views, and he's going back and reviewing them. So he's discussing the matches, breaking them all down, you know, analyzing and critiquing it. I mean, he's suffering 2012. I think for that alone, from him going back and watching all the pay-per-views from 2012, is enough for me to say, guys, go and subscribe to him because he is suffering that for our entertainment uh, he's very, very good. He's just started to do his reviews in video format. He used to write them all up on the forums. Now he's doing them in like a 20, 30 minute video format, like a podcast type of thing like I'm doing. So I highly recommend you guys go and check out his channel. The link to it will be in the description down below. And uh, he's been a long time supporter of the Brennan Plays channel. And uh, I want to kind of give back to him and say thanks to him by shouting him out today. All right, so the biggest news this week came from the tragic passing of Dusty Rhodes, legendary and Hall of Famer Dusty Rhodes, one of the most influential persons and uh, personalities and wrestlers. He really did it all in the wrestling business, and uh, you know a lot of people uh, paid their respect this week for Dusty, which was great to see. A lot of people really showing their love and support for him. You know, he seemed like a guy that. Everybody loved, and that's really what you want to see in a person. He seemed like an all-around great guy, and uh, you know he was obviously a little bit before my time, but obviously I know what he has done for the business, so it's obviously a big, big loss for us. And he was still very actively involved, and uh, he was, I think he was the promo coach, trainer, what do you want to call it, in NXT. So he was helping a lot of the younger talents with their promos, and who better to to help out with promos than Dusty Rhodes? I mean one of the best promo cutters in the business. And, uh, you know, he, former NWA champion, you know, he was the king of many, many territories, and he was the booker of many, many territories. So he had a lot of involvement, you know, in the ring, backstage. You know, he wasn't just an in-ring performer. You know, we some of us aren't really aware of all the things he did creatively and all the involvement he had in so many different territories. And, you know, Dusty Rhodes... You know, helped helped nurture and helped bring in a lot of new talent. You know, Paul Heyman mentioned it that how Dusty Rose gave him a chance. So, it's guys like Dusty Rose that really helped shape the way the business is today. So, definitely Dusty Rose is a huge loss for everyone in the wrestling business. And I guess uh, I'm not exactly sure how he went, and uh, I think the details still aren't. 100% 100% confirmed at this time, but it was nice to see the WWE give him a big, a big, uh, a big, a big mention on the network, and you know they gave him the special. And I haven't watched the special yet. I'm probably going to watch it after I get done with the podcast today. But uh, it's very nice to see them paying their respects and, and giving a big tribute to Dusty, and uh, you know obviously doing so much, and he's been still actively involved for. Um, for the last 30, 40 years, haven't he? He's been in the business for a long, long time, and he, was a, he hasn't been an active wrestler for a long time, but he's still, you know, actively involved in backstage creatively and, you know, the off, you know, the on and off appearances on, you know, pre-show panels or he'll come out, you know, he was involved, was it last, a couple of years ago with the, the, the Rose Brother thing. So he's still actively involved up until, you know, probably a couple of weeks ago I heard that, uh, you know, 
he's I guess he's been sick, being a bit ill. You know, there, there are some rumors there, so I'm not gonna exactly confirm it or say it's fact, but uh, nonetheless, a big, big, big loss, and um, it's such a shame to see him go. Obviously, as well as that, we had the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. We're going to discuss Money in the Bank now. Look, a lot of people have been wanting to know my thoughts. And, you know, I tweeted a few things out of Money in the Bank. You know, obviously, I watched the whole pay-per-view. And I watched it also for the pre-show match. I, I like, honestly, am I going to wake up early to watch R-Truth versus King Barrett? Uh, King Barrett on my shit list. R-Truth on my I don't give a fuck list. So, I didn't really bother watching that. I think R-Truth won, so that just goes to show my point exactly about King Barrett and how the King in the Ring tournament was just a an idea out of nowhere, a cheap ploy to try and get network subscriptions, and they were never really going to do anything with the winner. I mean, bad news, Barrett, I think he's lost more matches than he's won as the King of the, win- King of the Ring winner. He was never going to get a title, never going to get a push, and if the fact that he's losing to R-Truth more than once, and on pay-per-view as well, just goes to show what they ca- what they think of this guy. I mean, he's done. I mean, I've been getting some criticism about my thoughts on Bad News Barrett, but the company obviously doesn't see anything in him anymore. And that's just, you know, that's a surprise because they have invested so much in him. But how much can you really invest in a guy and get nothing back? You know, this guy over pushed for five years. I mean, multiple, multiple IC title reigns. Multiple pushes only to be stopped by injury time and time again. And now he hasn't been injured and he's just been a flop. You know, the King Barrett thing was a colossal failure. And ever since he's returned, he's just had no momentum at all. And they tried. They just gave him King in the Ring, just hoping something would come out of it. And it didn't work. You know, they tried for about two or three weeks and they gave up. So whether that's a creative fault, it probably is. But I also think Bad News Barrett has just had so many chances. You got guys from NXT. You got a lot of guys that probably deserve the spot more than he does. Give it to them. I mean, I I know a lot of people like Barrett, and I know a lot of people from the UK are probably hoping and crossing their fingers that he's their big, you know, Lord and Savior. That he's going to be the guy that finally wins the world title for the UK. It's not going to happen. Bad News Barrett just does not have it. He just does not cut it. Just he sucks. I just don't care for him at all. So him losing that hard truth, I laughed at it. I was kind of happy, to be honest with you. So we opened up the the main show with the Money in the Bank match. Honestly, I thought this match was was shit. I, I it was okay. I mean, it wasn't shit, but it was, it just was. You know, when it's the major drawing card of the pay per view, you obviously expect a lot of it. And you know, honestly, when coming into the match, you know, I probably got what I expected. I wasn't really hyped up at all. I mean, look who was in the match: Neville, Kingston, you know, Orton, Reigns, Sheamus, Kane. I mean, I guess we really got what we expected. I mean, there wasn't really much excitement about it at all. I mean, some people honestly thought Kofi Kingston had a chance of winning. Let's be honest, he didn't have a chance in hell. Neville, I mean, probably 2% chance of winning. Kane, I would say no chance in hell. Um, It was really between Reigns and the outsider of Sheamus. And we had the swerve that Reigns was probably going to win, and then we had Bray Wyatt come out and attack Reigns, and I'll talk more about that later, but, oh, that was bad. And now Sheamus, once he once he was alone, once everyone else was taken out, and the only guy who was left was Sheamus, I was like, oh, my God, Sheamus is winning. And it's just, oh, man, I just feel as though Sheamus at this point, trying to push him into the world title picture is too much too soon. He's turned heel, he's doing okay as a heel in the mid card, but now they're going to basically force a, a world title Sheamus reign on us. Does anybody, honestly, let me know in the comment section below, do you honestly want to see Sheamus as the world champion in 2015, 2016? I don't. You know, especially when you have Reigns, Rollins, Ambrose, you have Lesnar still around. Hell, I would probably rather see John Cena with a world title than, than uh, Sheamus. You know, you have Kevin Owens around as well. Perhaps Finn Balor coming up. You know, Ryback's doing decent. So you got some guys there that are probably deserving more so than Sheamus, who hasn't drawn a dime in years, hasn't been interesting in years, and hasn't had a decent match in a long time. He's been stale. Now he's changed his character up. But what has he really changed? 
He's changed his theme song and he's changed his appearance, but his moves in the ring are all the same. Everything, his same matches over and over, still the same. Bro kick out of nowhere, one, two, three kind of bullshit. It's still the same shit, but he just it just looks differently. He just has a stupid mohawk and a, and a shitty beard. I mean, Sheamus, to me, he's been, what, full-time world champion? Undeservingly so. You know, we had a couple of years away from Sheamus as a world champion. Thank God that we, we we merged the two titles together so guys like Sheamus should not win the belt. Guys who should be upper mid-carders at best should never be a world champion. If they're going to be a world champion, maybe once. That's it. But four title reigns from Sheamus, he should be... I mean, whoever likes Sheamus, oh my God. I mean, he must have a lot of support backstage. He must be sucking up to somebody because Sheamus does not deserve to win money in the bank. Nor do I honestly think, like I said last week, I don't really see Roman Reigns as a Money in the Bank winner. But the idea of Roman Reigns cashing in on Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar, making it a triple threat, this time Roman Reigns wins it, that sounds a lot more appealing and think that would make more sense and develop more of a storyline rather than just having Sheamus win it. And then in sometime in November, because he has the Money in the Bank, he has to cash in and we have to suffer a Sheamus reign for three or four months. You know, I honestly don't want to see Sheamus as the world champion. It's not a good time either. You know, I'm enjoying Seth Rollins. Obviously, last week I also said that he was one of the worst, uh, least credible champions of all time. And that's true. Very, very true. But I still am very entertained by Seth Rollins. And he still puts on really, really good matches. But Sheamus, oh man, I just don't know. I, You know, I just think there's other guys I would rather see win it. And I guess they kind of backed themselves into a corner. And someone brought up a point as well. Would this have been Rusev? Would Rusev have been money in the bank holder and now that, you know, if he didn't get injured, would it have been, would have, would have it have been Rusev rather than Sheamus? I honestly think yes. I think that's a good point. You know, I thought about it and I thought, yeah, it probably would have been. You know, they brought back Sheamus. They, they, they didn't do much with him. At first they did a little bit, then they stopped and they kind of put him in the back burner for a good month or two there. But obviously, when it came around Money in the Bank time, they started to kick him in the gear again and, you know, got him the win. But I just got the feeling that maybe Rusev could have been the guy. Obviously, he suffered a lot of losses and, you know, he lost, you know, Lana, he lost the title or whatever, whatever. So he lost all that, but he could have hit back and won Money in the Bank and, you know, could have stuck it to Lana and stuck it to the U.S. title and, you know, gone from there. And I've always been pushing for Rusev to be in the main event. I always feel as though Rusev could be a top-level heel. So, I just kind of feel as though that was a bit of a missed opportunity there. And you would have someone different as well. We've seen Sheamus versus Cena. And, oh, by the way, Sheamus versus Randy Orton. I'm going to talk about it later, but, my God, we're going to have to suffer another Sheamus and Orton feud. Jesus Christ. I mean, what a, what a way to waste Randy Orton on Sheamus. I mean, come on. You could have Rand- I mean, the, it just goes to show the lack of heels in the company. We need more heels. And Randy Orton... On Sheamus is just a waste, but uh, yeah, as, as you can see, I'm not very thrilled that Sheamus won. I just don't want to see him as well champion. I, I was liking the Sheamus character. Don't get me wrong, I've enjoyed the Sheamus heel turn, but I'm enjoying it as a mid card act, and not as a this guy should be the next world champion kind of thing. We don't want to see Sheamus as world champion. That's the thing. Sheamus has always been more, you know, just too over pushed throughout his whole career. And that, to me, is a big turnoff. And he's been shoved down our throats, similar to Cena. Now he's done the heel turn. He's doing okay. And now, once again, he's going to have the money in the bank. It's just like, oh, my God, do I want to watch this? And I fell asleep on Raw today. I fell asleep watching Sheamus versus Dean Ambrose. At the start of the show, I fell asleep. You know, I got through the Seth Rollins promo. I enjoyed the opening segment. Then Sheamus and Ambrose came out, and I was, yeah, I was done. <laughs> So, the man, I'll talk about the primetime players winning the tag team titles. Obviously, a big fan of the PTP. I didn't want them to win on this pay-per-view, though. I really felt as though the New Day should have cheated to win, held onto the titles for one more time, had the primetime players get their rematch, perhaps at Battleground, perhaps at SummerSlam, perhaps, you know, you had a number one contender match at Battleground, primetime players versus whoever, had the primetime players win then, get the number one contendership, get the title, and then have their title match at SummerSlam, and then have them win the titles at SummerSlam. 
Instead, we got a, a rushed push from the primetime players and a meaningless, nobody-gave-a-shit victory when they won the tag titles. So it just goes to show, if you build something up for a couple of months, you make it more meaningful. It could have had a more of an impact, but instead, they rushed it, they just gave him the titles for whatever reason. And it just didn't really work. The crowd didn't respond the way that we thought we could have had them respond if we had it done it properly and more slowly. Because you got to remember, the primetime players were a you know a job attack team for a long time, and for the majority of their run, have sucked. You know, not because they haven't been entertaining; it's just because kayfabe wise, they've sucked. They've always lost. They've never been a strong, credible threat to the tag titles. They were at one point, you know, in 2012, but now in 2015, not so much. But all of a sudden, they get a couple of victories, and now the tag champions. It's kind of like what, really? I just felt as though if they had to build that up for a couple of months and maybe did the payoff at SummerSlam, it would have been more effective. And I guess they probably are transitional champions. They're going to probably beat the New Day again, get rid of the New Day, out of the title picture, but I don't know why. New Day did, New Day are doing very, very well. Get them out of the title picture, transitional champions for White, uh, Rowan, and Harper, and probably have them win the tag team titles and uh, go on to be the, the leader of the tag team division for quite some time, probably have a very dominant run. So I just don't think the prompt time players. I would say they might not hold them for. I'd be I'd be surprised if they make it out of battleground with the titles. To be honest with you. And Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose, the main event was a long one, a ladder match, and this one was a little bit weird. This match this match was a little bit weird. Seth Rollins working Ambrose's leg the whole time, and Ambrose running around. Then oh shit, my leg's sore. I gotta sell it. It was pretty bad selling from Ambrose, and he did it again on Raw. It just, just bad, just really bad. It just, he was he's moving freely, and then all of a sudden he has a limp, and he keeps moving freely. It just, it just looked bad. I did enjoy the match, though. I just thought, it, I don't know, I just kind of missed something. I don't know. It just, it was good. I did enjoy it. The finish was a little bit. The finish sucked. I mean, Seth Rollins towards the end of the match was looking so dominant. He took Ambrose out. And Ambrose, by the way, looked fucking awesome. He just kept getting up after everything. He was just... He almost had to kill him to keep him down. So Ambrose looked good. You know, is that believable? Yes. Okay, maybe not. But Ambrose looked great. Seth Rollins, you know, he beat the hell out of Ambrose. He gave him everything. He, you know, hit him with the chair, hit him with the ladders. He did absolutely everything to Dean Ambrose. And... and, um, he couldn't beat him. He could not beat him without Ambrose climbing up to the ladder and becoming, you know, inches away from winning. Seth Rollins beat the shit out of Ambrose, but you couldn't have the champion climb the ladder and grab the belt and look strong. You had to have the champion climb the ladder and Ambrose climb it with him and narrowly keep the title. To me, it's just bad. It just it does not make Rollins look good at all. Yes, he did it all by himself. Thank God. But... Did he really look good coming out of it? I mean, now do we all of a sudden say, okay, Seth Rollins can win matches by himself. He's the man. Let's go, Seth. He can do it all by himself. Doesn't need the authority. It's more of a case of, yeah, Seth was pretty good, but Ambrose almost got it. Ambrose almost beat him. Seth just got lucky. Just managed to hold on to the title on the way down. It just doesn't make Rollins look good at all. So just another thought, you know... Do we really want our champion to look like an absolute scrub every single time he has a title offense? It just it just looks like a joke. And the real main event of the show for me, the match I was always looking forward to, uh, Kevin Owens versus John Cena. Match of the year candidate. Was it the match of the year? I'm not sure. I think I might have to watch it again. Um, I did really, really, really enjoy it. But whilst I was enjoying it, I was just like, is this... Is this better than the other matches I've seen this year? Was this better than the Triple Threat? You know, my other favorite match of the year probably was the the WrestleMania main event. Was this better than that? I'm not sure, but I think it might have been better than the Elimination Chamber match, I think. Obviously, Cena winning perhaps may have put a damper on it for me. Maybe that's why I wasn't 100% on the the bandwagon for this being the best match of the year, just from the result. But um, Cena pulling out lots of moves. He basically did everything he possibly could. He had to bring out some new tricks, had to do everything he possibly could to try and win. And that was great to see. Really good storytelling in this match. That's what I really enjoyed about this match. A great story being told. 
Kevin Owens giving Cena everything he can handle, and Cena just just winning. And then at the end of the match, Cena trying to shake Owens' hand, and Owens hits him with the the power bomb under the apron, just like he did to Sami Zayn a few months ago. That was great to see. I, and now Cena, um, I believe he wasn't on Raw. I mean, obviously, I think I I did fall asleep through Raw, and I went back and just skimmed over the the shit bits. So maybe I missed Cena, but I don't think he was on Raw. So that was good. They kept Cena off Raw. He probably will be back next week, let's be honest with you. But to be honest with you, they should keep Cena off and don't have him back come back until after Battleground or, or at Battleground because that way you can save Cena versus Owens 3 for SummerSlam and that the injury and the comeback from the injury from Cena means a lot more than that, that he's out for a good four or five weeks. And that would obviously make the SummerSlam match big. You know, it's the rubber match. And I honestly think that should be the main event. I mean, Owens and Cena have been killing it. Fantastic matches. And you could even put both titles on the line if you want. You know, have the US title on the line, which is what Owens wants. You could do so much with it. It'd just be a fantastic match. Put a stipulation involved. Make it a, a no-holds-barred match. And have these guys just go out and kill each other. It'd just be fantastic to see. But obviously, Cena and Owens, best match of the night. A highlight of the show. Those guys just work so well together. Kevin Owens has just been so impressive. Everything he's done, his promos, his matches, you know, his storytelling, you know, in NXT and now in the WWE, he's just doing so well. He's been very, very impressive. The crowd are still yet to get fully on on the Owens bandwagon. Obviously, he is a heel, but, you know, his merchandise is selling well. He's getting over. It's going to take a while before he's, you know, he's a big, bad, hated heel. But, you know, he's getting some cheers. He's doing pretty well. And, you know, for a guy who's only been on the, on the main roster for a couple months now, doing very, very well. It's been very, very entertaining and impressive to see him. You know, I really, really enjoyed his work. So, looking forward to seeing the third match. I just hope it's not at a battleground. I mean, Brock Lesnar is going to be at battleground. I think that's already a waste as it is. To be honest with you, the WWE... Save your big matches. Save your matches for your summer slams, and try and build, book a bigger building, and you know, get a forty thousand seat r- arena, and try sell the freaking thing out. You know, that's what I would be doing. Save your big matches, you know, for the big shows. Don't waste them away on battleground, which half the people won't even give a shit about. Battleground has been shit every single year. Don't waste it again. I mean, come on. But um, that's money in the bank. I think I gave the show. Uh, I think it was better than Elimination Chamber, but you know the Owens and Cena match was the the highlight. Ambrose and Rollins was better than their Elimination Chamber match as well. I don't know what I give it, Elimination Chamber six out of ten. Maybe this is six and a half out of ten. It was it was decent. Like you know it was it was it was okay. Monday Night Raw, as I said earlier, Randy Orton versus Sheamus. Why are we seeing this rivalry again? Why? I mean, didn't they learn a few years ago when we had the the Raw after WrestleMania? We had the crowd doing the the Mexican wave and chanting everything that they can possibly think of other than Randy Orton and Sheamus. You know, the crowd just don't care. And these two guys, they just just bore me in the ring. I just don't think they have good chemistry. We've seen the feud so many times. I think we've seen over 40 televised matches between the two. I think it's approaching 50 more so than in the lower 40s. So... We've seen these guys so many times in the past five years. We don't need to see this again. And it's obviously pretty clearly it's filler. You know, these guys just have no no one else to face. You know, I thought Sheamus and Ryback should have had a feud, but instead we have Ryback and the Big Show and now the Miz for whatever reason. And I, by the way, I was Ryback should be Big Show. Come on, you know, the Miz interfering. I was actually enjoying Ryback and the Big Show. I was actually enjoying that match. And the Miz interfering was just, uh, I was like, oh, damn. I was actually enjoying the match. I was enjoying Ryback tossing the Big Show around. And <laughs> it was kind of fun to see Ryback. I wanted to see him pick Big Show up and shell shock him and pin the big the big prick in, in, you know, in a three count and pin him in the middle of the ring. That would have been great to see. But instead, we had to have a DQ finish. Couldn't have the Big Show lay down. Nope. But uh, I, I digress. So Randy Orton Sheamus, again, not looking forward to it probably will fall asleep during that again. I mean, it's just just bad. Roman Reigns versus Bray Wyatt. This feud. This is just another example of two guys. We don't know what the fuck to do with them. Let's put them together for a meaningless feud. Bray Wyatt has not been relevant for months. 
Bray Wyatt is struggling. Bray Wyatt doesn't know what Bray Wyatt is. We don't know what Bray Wyatt is doing. His character has gone to shit. His promos are the same thing over and over again. His matches are boring. Bray Wyatt has just been nothing but shit. they got to save Bray Wyatt. I like Bray. So much potential, but what are they doing with him? You had him have a feud with Ryback. It was random. It was... Uh, it was just a one match, you know, Ryback, they built this up of this guy, Bray Wyatt, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you, I'm coming for you, I'm, you know, I want Bray, I want to fight somebody, it turned out to be Ryback, you had Bray Wyatt beat Ryback, and then a month later, Ryback wins the IC title, and Bray Wyatt's not even on the card, it's just like, what are they doing, Bray, and now all of a sudden, he's feuding with Roman Reigns, for what, why, you know, I know Roman Reigns beat uh, Bray Wyatt to get his spot in the Money in the Bank, so, I guess loosely, that's why, you know, Reigns beat Bray Wyatt. I didn't listen to the promo on Raw. I skipped over it, so perhaps they explained it yeah, there, and it was my bad for not watching that. But it's just bad, man. It's just no good. It's just, I don't know. Bray Wyatt just, they need to find something for him. And Roman Reigns, he's probably going to beat Bray Wyatt and just keep looking strong into SummerSlam. I think that's where I see it. And probably Bray Wyatt won't even be on the card for SummerSlam. Kevin Owens, another great promo from him on Raw. He's just a future star. He, Kevin Owens is just on fire right now. I enjoyed his promo. Him powerbombing uh, Machine Gun Kelly, I think his name, NGK. Him powerbombing him was just was great. And, um, you know, MGK, I, I skipped over that. I mean, I heard a little bit of it. He sucks. He's just awful. An, an awful artist. He's just... If, I use that loosely. He sucks. So Kevin Owens powerbombing him onto basically a mattress. <laughs> like, that was not, that would not have hurt. I mean... So kudos to him, though. Kudos to MGK to to actually take that bump. Like, it's not really a bump. I mean, he landed on a fucking mattress. But kudos to him to actually do that. You know, a lot of celebrities would not have gotten physical. So I do have respect for him to do it for doing that. And, you know, I think more people kind of cheered for that rather than booed it. But it was good to see. And I just think Brock Lesnar coming back on Raw tonight saved the show. I just kind of felt the show was a little flat and I was waiting for Lesnar. You know, when I heard about the the, the Battleground opponent, I felt this is surely going to be Lesnar. Lesnar surely should be coming back. And then they didn't mention his name all night. And I got the feeling, yep, surely it's going to be him. And then they kept building it up at the promo at the end. And Seth Rollins... His reaction was priceless when it was Lesnar. It was just priceless. Seth Rollins looked like, you know, he was just shitting himself. He was just scared. And he just looked like he'd seen a ghost. And it was just hilarious. So I really enjoyed that. Brock Lesnar coming back. Thank God. Something to spice the show up. And now we get some Paul Hammond promos again as well. So that'll be great. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I wonder if he'll be on Raw next week. Probably not. Maybe just Paul Heyman next week. And then, uh, you know, maybe the the show, the go-home show for Battleground, you bring Lesnar back. Would have liked to have seen Rollins attack Lesnar, though. I felt as though Rollins, I was just thinking, he's going to attack. He's going to attack just to show who the man is. You know, Rollins going around saying, I'm the man, I'm the man, I can beat it, anybody. I just felt as though Seth Rollins, for his character's purposes, I felt as though he should have attacked Brock Lesnar. But he didn't. He backed down. So I just felt as though that was a bit of a miss. I think Rollins should have attacked Lesnar, and obviously Lesnar would have countered and got the better of Rollins. Then Rollins sneaks away and says, okay, screw it. But he should have at least tried, in my opinion, just to just to look good. You know, I just think that would have built the, the, the rivalry a little bit better. And, you know, Lesnar, he should have... Lesnar, like, you got to remember, when Lesnar left, he was absolutely pissed, absolutely furious at Seth Rollins, and now he's back, he doesn't want to attack him, I thought Lesnar would have just jumped in the ring and just gone and beat the shit out of Rollins, because you remember last time he left, he beat up all the announcers, he was irate, he was going off his head, now that he's back, he has Seth Rollins right in front of him, doesn't do anything, it's just kind of like, wow, what, you know, so that was a, that was a little bit weird, I think they should have got physical there, but nonetheless, good to see Lesnar back. And my final thoughts on Monday Night Raw is Dean Ambrose. 
Are we going to see Ambrose versus Kane? What's the future of Dean Ambrose? Are we going to see Ambrose fight for the title numerous times only for him to now have nothing to do? It's just, I'm a little worried. You know, what's next for Ambrose? I think an Ambrose versus Kane feud would be literally one of the worst things you could do. I mean, who want, who the hell wants to see that? How many, how many times have we seen Ambrose versus Kane? Enough. We don't need to see it anymore. So I'm hoping they can get something else for him. But that's the thing. What other heels are there to face? They need to turn someone heel. That's why I was saying Roman Reigns should have turned heel. Turned heel on Dean Ambrose. But nope. We, we're stuck. We don't we don't have enough heels to accommodate for the top baby faces. We have so many top baby faces, but only like two or three top heels. That's the problem. That's why we're having Big Show, Kane, Mark Henry over and over. We need to change that. All right. So now it's time for this week's What Is Brendan Playing? Not playing a lot. I, if you've been following my second channel, Brendan's Platinums, I did pick up another Platinum this week. It was just a little PSN game. I picked up LA Cops. I was like $12. And surprisingly, it was kind of fun. You know, I obviously have bought the game because it had some pretty easy trophies. A lot of golds. Didn't really take a long time to get the Platinum. So I kind of got the game just to check it out and get the easy trophies. But I actually really ended up enjoying it. So LA Cops was something that I really enjoyed. So if you are a trophy hunter, definitely LA Cops is a very easy game to Platinum. But um, certainly... Check it out. You might actually enjoy it. I mean, it's not a long game, obviously. So if you're looking for a long, uh, you know, triple A game, you're not not going to get that with this. But you know, it was on sale, so I picked it up nice and cheap, and uh, it turned out to be pretty good. But other than that, uh, the Battlefield Hardline DLC is about to drop. Probably by the time you're listening to this, I will have gotten it, and I will be playing it. I'm really, really keen for that. I'm going to get the BPZ uh, forums crew, you know, and get, probably have a big gaming night playing some. Uh, Hardline DLC. I've been a little bored of Hardline, so I really do need a map pack to get me going again. So this map pack is very, very exciting and much needed. And other than that, not a lot because I've had exams and obviously my birthday was uh, on Monday as well. So I've had some, you know, I've had a pretty busy week. Um, I, instead of playing games, I've pretty much been watching TV and uh, I went to the movies. I watched the Entourage movie. And uh, maybe, maybe this segment should be called "What am I up to?" Like, what have I been doing this week <laughs> instead of what I've been playing? Because I kind of go into a bit of a tangent, like talking about everything else. So maybe we'll think about a tra- change in the future. But I went to the Entourage movie, and if you guys know, Entourage is one of my favorite shows. I absolutely loved the movie. It was amazing, fantastic. Laughed my head off. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Saw San Andreas as well for, on my birthday, and uh, that was very, very intense, but a very, very good movie. The Rock was great in it. I really, really enjoyed it as well. It such an intense, full-on movie. Kind of crazy. It was, wow. It was, it was, it was, it was great, great. So, really enjoyed that. So, a few movies as well. i um, been watching the TV show Wentworth, which is pretty similar to Orange is the New Black, but it's like the Australian kind of take on it. It's it's similar, but it's not exactly like a rip-off or anything like that. It's got its own kind of flavor to it. Um, really enjoy that. So I highly recommend that show. It's obviously a women's prison kind of show. It's a drama. It's not like a real-life kind of thing. Very similar to Orange News Black, like I said, which, I'm by the way, I haven't seen season three yet. Looking forward to seeing that. So if you have seen it, let me know how it is because um, I'm probably going to watch that in my holidays, which is coming up. Uh, I've got one more exam next week, and then I'm done. I'm finished, so I've got a, I've got a month off. So I expect to see a lot more videos, and that's when I'm going to be starting my new series. I'm going to be starting a couple of a series on the PS2. At the moment, the poll on my website, which, by the way, you can go on brendanplaces.com and vote for what game we'd like to see next on my channel. At the moment, Here Comes the Pain is well in front. I think it's 33%, and then SmackDown vs. Raw 2007 GM mode is like 23%. So it's got a pretty big lead at the moment. So I probably will be playing a Here Comes the Pain playthrough, but I might do GM mode as well, and we'll see how we go. Like if I record a lot of episodes at a time and really get on top of it, I think I could do more than one, and maybe I could do double uploads at some time and really keep the ball rolling. We're really looking forward to doing something different on the channel because you know, obviously at the moment I've got the My Career Universe mode and Let's Talk Tuesdays, and that's really about it. So I think. I feel as though I'm missing something on the channel, so that should be very exciting to do. I wanted to talk about E3 today, and it was something that's happening as we speak. You know, we saw 
today on Tuesday it was a big Sony press conference and Microsoft as well had their little press conference as well. I think Nintendo is coming up next. And uh, I'm not really, I don't really care about Nintendo all that much, but uh, it's definitely Sony delivered, in my opinion. EA, we, they they were pretty good as well. So and Bethesda was fantastic. So we're going to talk about some games. So first of all, Fallout 4. This game looks absolutely phenomenal. I love Fallout. Absolutely love it. So when I saw the demo, when I saw the trailer, I fell in love. And I instantly thought to myself, holy shit, this game is going to be a game changer. Because Fallout, I've always loved it. The concept is fascinating. The concept is really fun. Love Fallout 3. New Vegas, didn't really dig it at first. But it grew on me. And I absolutely loved it in the end. I played it a couple times. I really should go back and replay Fallout 3. Especially before I get New Vegas. Which is coming out in November. That's exciting. So... Very, 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 very much so looking forward to Fallout 4. Game looks good, and I like how they, they seem as though they're going to explain the story, and they're going to show the story before the nuke, show life before the nuke, and then you come out of the vault and show life after the nuke. So that's kind of cool. That's something they haven't really touched on yet, so that's something that I think would be very interesting to see as well. And a lot of people have been kind of like criticizing the graphics, but to me... The graphics are good. I mean, I, I, I like the graphics, and I'm not a graphics whore, you know, for lack of a better word, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a real, like, the graphics have to be 1080p, running at 60 frames per second, you know, it has to be all this. I don't really care. The gameplay is the most important thing. As long as the graphics look nice, you know, it's it's everything's clear, and, you know, you know what I mean. Like, the graphics, as long as they look pretty good, you know, they have to be perfect, but for a game like Fallout, for it to honestly function properly, it needs a drop in the graphics. It's a huge game. There's so much going on. You can't honestly expect it to have top-of-the-line graphics, you know, cinematic graphics, when there's so much going on. You, this is not realistic. You just We're just not there yet. So a game like Fallout won't have graphics like that. and doesn't need it. Fallout 3, you look back at it now, the graphics weren't all that fascinating. Fallout New Vegas, the same thing, but... You know, I still felt as though they got the job done, and they still the game still looked pretty, and I think the, it really did it justice. The, the, the surroundings of the games, the environment of the great games, look still re- really good. So Fallout 4 not having the world's best graphics isn't going to ruin the game. If anything, you know, I don't think it's going to have any effect at all. I think the game's going to be fantastic. The gameplay looks fun, and everyone was kind of harping on about the dog as well. The dog's not going to be important at all. Like, come on. If you've played Fallout, you know the dog is going to have no purpose at all. But what I really like is the fact that our character that we play as is going to be actually voice acted. So that's very exciting in my opinion. You know, the character, you know, has traditionally never said anything. It's just been textual based. But now it's full on voice and you can dictate where it all goes. You can, you know, that's where Fallout really needed to go. And I'm really glad they're doing that. So Fallout 4 Huge tick from me. Looking forward to it. Another game that is uh, on the horizon, Dishonored 2. So Bethesda really ticked the, you know, was fantastic. And they're also going to bring out a new Doom as well. So Dishonored, I love Dishonored. Great game. Platinumed it. Loved it. Cannot wait for the second one. Definitely getting that. The new Doom, I've been on the fence about Doom. Obviously, we haven't had a new Doom for a while. So, it's a bit of a reboot Reboot in the series. Can they honestly compete in this day and age? I don't know. I just think Doom, they'll make a good game, but they're going to probably miss a few things that current shooters have that works. I just feel as though they're going to miss a few things, and their game might be swept under the rug after a few weeks. I just get the feeling that's what's going to happen with Doom. I may get it. I may not. I'm not sure yet. New Hitman, I love Hitman, so I'm very excited to see the new Hitman released as well. Um, some of these games haven't got around to seeing the trailers yet, but I've, I've heard about them, I'm looking forward to them. Uncharted 4, and we saw some more gameplay of that, the game looks beautiful, cannot wait for that. NBA Live 16, I saw the trailer on that one, I managed to get the chance to see that one. The game, I mean, I've, I'm have i a big fan of NBA games, but it just feels like Live is just years behind, just years behind. And I just feel as though 
they're not really being innovative. Like, they're not really making anything that 2K hasn't already got. Or, you know, if they are doing it, it's not something that's really a game changer. Like, live, they're just not really creating anything that's going, yes, I must get this game because of this. They're not really doing that. And their graphics still seem kind of arcadey. You know, I think live needs to go in a different direction. You know, whether it's whether it's go to the NBA Street, you know, drop the live series, make street games and, and, and create that kind of vibe and go back to that kind of game or just go completely arcade, you know, where we saw, uh, what was it, NBA Jam, I think it's called, something like that. I just think NBA Live at this point as a realistic simulation of basketball will never compete. It will never be number one. It will never overtake 2K. They've lost too much market share. It's done. It's over. I played NBA Live 15. It's good. Like, it's it's a decent game. Like, it's just not great. It's just, like, you had the choice. You're going to pick 2K every day, every day of the week. It's just a no-brainer. They're just so far behind. You know, they are improving. Their game's getting better. It's just not up to industry standard at the moment. They're just not a realistic competitor at this point. One of the big things that uh, came about on E3 was the Xbox One backwards compatibility. So this is something that uh, really interests me. Not because I'm a, I am do have an Xbox One, but not because I, I never had a 360, so it doesn't really affect me. But because if Xbox One are doing this, does this mean Sony may follow suit? Backwards compatibility this is something that has always been a bit of controver- controversial because... Both the new generation consoles avoided it when, you know, in this day and age, I think most people would have appreciated it. This is the day and age of remasters, you know, remake games and try and sell it. And uh, anyone that bought the game and loved it on the on the older consoles may buy it again. Or someone who has changed generations or didn't buy the older consoles might, might pick up the games. You know, just a remaster generation. So many games are just remasters and nothing new. So now the backwards compatibility, will that kind of slow down the rate of remasteries on the Xbox? You know, will that encourage more people just to play their older games? I'm not sure, man. I mean, the Xbox One, this is a big move for them and something that they really needed to do. They had to do something drastic like this to try and get their console going again. Try and breathe some life in the console because they did lose something big today and we'll talk about that in a moment. But... They did lose Call of Duty exclusive exclusive rights, so they had to do something today to to fight back and hit back strong. And I think this is a good move, very very good move. I think this is a great move from Xbox and a much needed one, almost a console saving move. And obviously they only have a hundred titles available at this point, which is not bad. I mean, not too bad. It just got me wondering though: Will Sony follow suit? Will we see Sony try and deliver backwards compatibility on, on their side? Obviously, they're trying to push PlayStation now, and they're trying to get you to buy games again digitally and, you know, stream them or rent them. I just feel as though straight up being able to play, you put the disc in and play it is the way to go. Obviously, it's a money ploy, and it's trying to get you to rebuy games and, you know, stick with the new consoles. Because I think, honestly, though, like... Having the ability to play your older games on your new console, that's a drawing card. That's a big selling point because I think a lot of people who have a big backlog, have a lot of PS3 games, Xbox 360 games, probably avoided buying the new consoles because they thought, well, I can't play my games on that console. You know, I'm going to have to buy all these new games, going to have no games to play on it. I might as well just stick with my older console, finish the games I got then, and then and then I'll upgrade later on. You know, if they had had backwards compatibility from the get-go... Anyone could have played their older games on the PS4, and, you know, that would have been a drama. I think it just feels as though both, both of them missed a trick. I just feel as though avoiding the issue to try and generate sales on older games, I just think that's a, a waste. Remaster PS2, PS1 games. Don't remaster PS3 games. I think that's a bit too soon, in my opinion. Maybe if it's like a 2006 game... But a game that came out last year and porting it over to the new console, it's just like, come on, man. We should just be able to plug the game in and go again. Like, I bought GTA 5 on the PS3. Like, it'd just be nice to be able to plug it in and go on the PS4 and and play the damn game. But, you know, it is what it is. 
So I really felt as though both companies missed the trick. So I think Xbox going down that route is the way to go. So kudos to them. I think that was one of the big scalps of E3, Xbox doing that. Obviously, PS4, they picked up the DLC rights of Black Ops, Call of Duty Black Ops. So they have the 30 days before you know, the exclusive rights to the DLC. So they'll get the, the DLC a month before Xbox. It's always traditionally been Xbox before PS4. Is it too late to really for anyone to really care? Probably, but I still think it's a good move. PlayStation, you know, I, I think X, I think Call of Duty realized that Xbox is just so far behind, and I think even a lot of Call of Duty gamers are playing PS4 more so than the Xbox. Maybe they've had a look at their Xbox compared to PS4 player rates, and maybe the PS4 far exceeds the Xbox. And it's probably time that they uh, make the move and do what's best for their business. So, probably a good move. And for me, who am a PlayStation gamer, it's a good move because I've actually wanted to play a lot of the Advanced Warfare DLC and play some of the new maps and play some of the zombies. And it's always been the case in a lot of DLCs, Xbox having it first. And it's kind of annoying that, you know, I'm on the PS3, PS4, and I'm having to wait so long, an extra month. You know, it's just kind of like, oh man, come on. You know, it'd just be nice to have the DLC when it drops and have the maps and keep the game going because by the time you get the maps, the game's, like, really dying down. Like, you'll get the first map packed and three months later you get another one. It just it just really slows the game down and, you know, you need the new content to keep the game fresh and keep it going. But you're getting it too late to the point where you can already move on and go to other games. So I think it's a bad move on Call of Duty's um, point to even have exclusive rights at all. Obviously probably PlayStation is paying them to do so, but I think at this point, in Call of Duty status, just have it the same on both consoles. Does it really matter? You know, are you trying to... Are you going to get more money from PlayStation sales compared to Xbox sales, perhaps in this contract? But I think for the benefit of Call of Duty, you just have it on both consoles at the same time because having to wait for DLC, you know, you're going to go and see some other games. The new games are going to come out. You might drop... Advanced Warfare, I've dropped Advanced Warfare. I mean, the new map pack, with the one with High Rise, I think, hasn't even come out yet. I'm, I'd like to play that, but I've got so many other games, I've dropped Advanced Warfare and don't care for it anymore because I've had to wait so long to, to pick up the DLC. It's just, you know, what, what's the point? So I just think that's a bad move in general from Call of Duty. And having any exclusive rights, unless your game is completely exclusive, exclusive DLC rights is a bad move and just, just a way to piss off your fan base. It's just... In my opinion, I would not be doing that. Just have have the game exclusively on a console. That's the drawing card, you know, to sell the consoles. But to sell the DLC first on a console, I just think that's a bad move to really kind of separate and um, disengage your, your audience away from your game. And you know, perhaps they'll go to other games and look to other games and, you know, won't really end up picking up your DLC. And obviously, I've also mentioned this before back in the day in my older channel... You know, if you're going to, if you're waiting for a DLC to come, you can watch it all online. You can see it all on YouTube. And if everyone's saying the DLC sucks, then you won't buy it. You know, but whereas it comes out day one for everyone, everyone's going to pick it up. Everyone's going to play it. But if you have to wait a month and you can see all the zombie maps, you can see all the online maps, you can see everything online, you might not buy it. You go, well, I've already seen it all. It kind of looks okay. Yeah, not enough for me to really buy it. I don't think it really would interest me. Don't buy it. So I just think that's a bad move from Call of Duty in general. And any game thinking about doing the same thing, don't do it because it will really hurt your game more so than benefit you, in my opinion. Obviously, I, I, I'm very interested to see what WWE 2K16 is going to do. I don't know if they're going to be at E3. I thought they were. I don't know if what day they're on or if they are going to be on. I don't think we've heard anything from 2K yet. So is 2K having an allocated day. I'm not sure. I'm not really looking into E3. I've just been watching some trailers here and there. Really looking forward to seeing what 2K does deliver on W2K16. I think W2K16 will be much better than 2K15. I, I said very boldly that 2K15 would be the best WWE game last year. I was very, very wrong. I just felt as though they had the potential. But the fact that they took so many things out of the game ruined the chances. If they put the things back in that was in 2K14, these updated graphics, this new gameplay elements, this game's going to be great. In my career, they keep refining it. I think my career needs to be voice acted by as well. You know, I mean, you had the older games of voice acted. Come on, voice act this one. 
do it right, and this game will be great. I think 2K16 has the potential. Give us a decent roster. I mean, 2K15's roster was awful. 2K14 had probably the best roster ever. So it's just kind of concerning, you know. You had 2K14 to 15, the differences are so major, and you know, the the quality differences, you know, 2K14 was so good, you know, 2K14 was really, really good, it just missed the good graphics to go along with it, it was just really outdated graphics that made the game look kind of ugly at that point, 2K15 fixed that, but lost everything that made 2K14 good in the process, so if they can make their game better without having to make sacrifices this year, and just add in these other extra creative elements to the game, I think 2K16 is going to be very, very exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing it, looking forward to uh, playing it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have any kind of uh, deal going with 2K, so I don't get the game early. I don't get to fly out to LA and play the game early. And I don't get the... I have to pay the game, pay and buy the game just like everyone else. I have to do all that. That kind of sucks. You know, I wish... Hey, 2K, if you're listening, feel free to hook me up. But... Unfortunately, I don't get any of that. I don't get any special privileges. I don't know the, the inside scoop. I don't know anything about the game. I know as much as you guys do. So I'm just a fan looking forward to playing the game. That's pretty much my E3 coverage. I kind of went on that for a long time. But a lot to talk about in gaming. And I'm a big gamer. I play a lot of games. So I definitely have my opinions on what's going on. And uh, to, to wrap up today's show, we do have some questions from you guys. We're going to answer a few questions before we get the hell out of here. All right, so this first one comes from... Oh boy, this is gonna say, this is gonna this is gonna be tough. Doctor La Neva, I think La Neva. Okay, do you think the Miz and r Truth should reunite as a heel tag team? Nah, at this point, would anybody care? No, r Truth. Rumors of him retiring, perhaps at the end of the year or next year, sometime. There are some rumors of that. So an r Truth at this point is completely irrelevant. Nobody really cares for him. r Truth as a heel in 2011 and 2010 was doing some good things you know i think he what smoked on tv or he was doing some edgy things he was he was being good you know he's crazy now he's just kind of stupid you know his gimmick just is just stupidly bad and the miz is just so irrelevant beyond this point you know he has dropped so far and back then at least they were relevant at least they were doing okay now they're just beyond a joke so it would have no impact, no effect. No one would, would really care. So, our truth the Miz will pass. This next question comes from Declan Thompson. Are you practicing to be a commentator for the WWE? No, I'm not. I'm not practicing to be anything. I'm just doing this as a hobby, doing this for fun. I just enjoy giving my opinions on things on a podcast like this and then on the Universe Mode videos and the My Careers and the other series. I just enjoy talking over gameplay i just have a lot of fun i've always been very interested in doing this and i like the wwe and um i like being creative and and i i like booking my own shows and i like doing that and creating my own storylines i just get a lot of enjoyment out of it i'm very excited about when i make my universe mind episodes and when i can do cool things i get very excited and i really want to share it with you guys i really want to take my universe mode to the next level which is why i've I've tried to make the website like the home of Universe Mode. When you have uh, previews, you have write-ups, you got you know pictures and things like that. You know articles and videos and everything like that for Universe Mode. I really want to take it to the next level, and I, you know, it's a bit difficult when it's a one-man team. I can't really do what I would like it to be done, but definitely, I just enjoy Universe Mode, and it's not really another alternative. You know, I'm never not really thinking about a career at the end of this or anything like that i just do it for fun do it as a hobby and i guess it's kind of like a part-time job for me i mean i do obviously i'm a youtube partner so obviously make some revenue off doing the videos but it's not like a a career i'm never going to make it a career and a lot of people think that i'm probably going to try and make this my job definitely not you know i've got one more year left of university and then i'm out you know i've finished university and i'll have two degrees so after that who knows where my future is going to go. But for now, this is just a hobby to do. Keep me busy while I'm doing some studying and uni. And um, it's just fun. I just really enjoy doing it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a plan to get a job. And, like, honestly, if the WWE messaged me today and said, look, we'd like you to be a commentator and it was actually legit, I would probably take it. I honestly would. But let's be honest. I'm Australian. I got the accent. Not really any chance of me ever doing anything 
remotely related to being com- on commentary for the WWE. It's just how it is. But, like I said, if they wanted me to do something, you'd be mad to say no. Next up comes from Stephen Allen. Once Brian returns, do you think he'll have a good run? I don't think so, because I think when Brian returns, they're going to be very protective of him. Honestly, Brian should just take the whole year off. Even if he's healthy by September, take the whole year off. Don't bother come back. Give yourself an extra three months to heal. I heard an idea on another podcast, and they said that um, they should bring back Daniel Bryan as like the commissioner, as the board of directors should bring back Daniel Bryan, and they should make him the commissioner, and he should go against the authority. And obviously, you think about all the history that Bryan and the authority have had. It would make perfect sense. They were kind of wasting Bryan, having him off TV. I mean... Whether it does he need like a neck brace? Does, what does he need? Does he need like is he can he walk around like he had him on TV or Money in the Bag? He looked fine. They could obviously bring him back in some kind of authority role, some kind of capacity, like have him on the pre shows. Keep using him because you're wasting him. So he was so over. You're not having him on TV. I mean, I know when he comes back, you want it to be special, but he came back for such a short period of time. At this point. You should have him on TV and should have him in some kind of authority role. And once he gets healthy, then you do the turn, you do, then you do the tease. Maybe he's having, maybe he's screwing over Seth Rollins for a long time and eventually Daniel Bryan gets in the ring to, to settle it with Seth Rollins. You know, something like that. So I think they're wasting Daniel Bryan and I think he could have a good run. But in terms of his in-ring career at this point, when he comes back, they're going to be very protective of him, and I don't think they're going to rush him into any championships. I mean, maybe the title's a curse. Maybe he's cursed from winning championships. I don't know. But I just think they'll keep him away from anything major for a long time until they know 100% that he's ready to go. Next one from Viper Rules 101. Do you see a Randy Orton heel turn anytime soon? Definitely not, no. Randy Orton was a heel for a long time, and he's just kind of turned babyface when he did the whole thing with Seth hasn't been a face for long enough. He doesn't need to turn heel. He's doing good as a baby face. I think he's getting some good reactions. Obviously, feuding with Sheamus is not really helping out much. So I think Randy's kind of dropped a little bit now that he's gone away from the world title picture. But, you know, he can obviously pick it up. He's Randy fucking Orton, for God's sake. So he can do whatever the hell he wants. But I've been enjoying him. I've been enjoying him as a baby face, just not enjoying him versing Sheamus. So no heel turn. If anyone needs to turn heel, it's Reigns. Uh, I I'd say Ambrose, but I, w- I want to see Ambrose as a baby face. I think Reigns needs to turn heel. He's got to be the guy. Next one from Flynn. Do you think Tyson, Ki- career- Tyson Kidd's career is possibly over? Where do you see Cesaro going for the time being? In terms of Cesaro, it's really all about how long Tyson Kidd is going to be out for us. Tyson Kidd is out for the rest of the year. You can't have Cesaro off TV for the rest of the year. you got to have him come back you got to have him on singles. you just got to bring him back and push him as a singles. I think at the moment, they're kind of wondering and trying to find out how long Kid is out for. I think they probably don't know just quite yet, so they're kind of just waiting until they know for sure how long Kid is out for. If Kid is out till SummerSlam, you probably would keep Cesaro off TV. But if Kid is out for the rest of the year, you wouldn't break him up, but you'd have Cesaro go out there and do it by himself and, you know, Maybe when Tyson Kidd's healthy, you bring them back together. Because I did enjoy them as a tag team. I think them as a tag team, is uh, it was fun. I don't know if Tyson Kidd's career is over. And obviously, he has a neck injury, so that could be a major risk. I don't know the extent of his injury. But if he's healthy, then he will be back. But if he's you know if he's no good, well, then it's, it's a pretty big loss. Because I think Tyson Kidd's a great in-ring worker. He was doing really well, Cesaro. I think both guys are really getting quite popular. And I think uh, very, very impressive as a tag team. I was really enjoying their work. Next one, from Whiplash. Can you see Bully Ray and Devon coming back to the WWE? And if so, who will they face? Well, I don't know if you've been paying attention on Twitter, but Bully Ray and I think Luke Harper, perhaps it was Rowan, maybe one of, the, one of the two, were going at it back and forth because Harper and Rowan have been using the 3D. Now, I don't think that's a great decision to give them the 3D, but if it's to set up a storyline between Bully Ray and Devon, then sure. I don't know why they haven't signed the Bully Ray and Devon. You know, the age factor, like, who gives a shit? The tag team division is so boring at this point. You need a team. Like, if they're available, if they're on the market, just sign the guys. I mean, why not? You know, they have them come back for a couple-year run. You know, give them the belts, you know, put over some teams. 
you know, give them a run. You know, I think that'd be exciting, and people would actually start to care about the tag team division again. And you could help bring and build up some new teams, and you know, you can make Rowan and Harper, you know, this devastating dominant tag team, and have them go up against Bully Bully Ray and Devon for a m- number of months, and it'd be exciting. So Whiplash, to answer your question, I think if Bully Ray and Devon comes back, that's a no-brainer. Harper and Rowan has got to be the team, and they should be coming back. They should have been back already. They should have just signed Bully Ray after the Royal Rumble. I don't know why they haven't. Honestly, if it's not a tag team, at least get Bully in there as a singles, because I think Bully Ray as a singles guy is great. And I think they, they kind of missed a trick there. I know they want to go this whole youth movement, but they need stars. And the Team 3D, the Dudley Boys... They're a great team, one of the best ever, my favorite tag team. I would love to see them come back. So definitely, if they can get them back in there, Harp and Roll would be a great fit. Final question for today's Let's Talk Tuesdays comes from Jack Miller. Who do you think will be on the cover of W2K16? To me, it's a no-brainer. It's got to be Brock Lesnar. Absolutely, 100% Brock Lesnar. He's the biggest star you have in the company right now. You haven't had him on the on the cover yet. Since he's been back, you know, we had 2012 was, uh, was CM Punk. W12 was CM Punk. W13, no, was it? Maybe I got it mixed up. I don't know. W13, CM Punk, I think. 2K14, The Rock. And 2K15, John Cena. So, to me, it kind of suggests if they have to have one guy on there, who else is there to really put on there? Roman Reigns, yeah, Dean Ambrose, no, Seth Rollins, come on, Brock Lesnar's the guy. If you're going to have multiple guys in there, I would put all three Shield guys, I'd put Reigns, Rollins, Ambrose, put them on the on, on the one on the one uh, game, on the one poster, on the one cover, if you're forgetting the word, put them on the one cover, so I'd have the Shield on the one cover, obviously they're not in the Shield anymore, but still, they're your three next big up and coming rising superstars. And if you market the game around, you know, the future, then perhaps that's the way to go. But to be honest with you, Brock Lesnar had one of the best years of all time, kayfabe-wise, last year in the WWE. You know, beat the streak, you know, dominated Cena, won the belt, blah, 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 blah. Had a great year. So you'd have to be, you'd have to put Lesnar on the, on, the, on the cover. And I think the reason why they haven't shown the cover yet, haven't revealed the cover, is because Lesnar hasn't been back. And I think you'll find that uh, they'll probably... They'll probably show who's on the cover in the next couple of weeks now that Lesnar is back. He'll probably be on one of the shows leading up to SummerSlam, and they'll probably release the cover then. And the authority will probably, you know, put Lesnar on the cover and make Seth Rollins jealous, and they might use it to work an angle and to keep developing their storyline, something like that. But now that Lesnar's back, you'll probably find that will that they will release the cover very soon, and maybe I don't know, maybe they'll release it at E3 or on the coming weeks. I don't know, but. Definitely for me, Brock Lesnar is the right decision to make. I think that's going to do it, guys. This week's Let's Talk Tuesday. I hope you guys definitely enjoyed it. And if you did, please leave a like on the video. Make sure you haven't already to hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. And if you want to leave a donation for the show and help the sh- help the show keep running, you can do so on the Bread and Plays website. As well as that, we have plenty of t-shirts for you guys to buy. $20 a t-shirt. That would be really, really great. I'm thinking about moving the t-shirt store over to Pro Wrestling Tees if I can get accepted on there. And that would be very exciting to do. So I'm hoping we can do that in the future. So that's kind of like the future of the t-shirt. So definitely pick yourself up a t-shirt. They're really, really good, actually. And, um, you know, we're getting a couple of sales recently. We gave one away on my Twitch stream this week as well, which was really, really, really cool. And, uh, of course, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes. Keep supporting the show on Spreaker. Almost at 100 followers. We're getting close to breaking the top 10 on Spreaker, so keep the support coming. Keep keep uh, favoriting all the shows. Make sure you haven't already. Follow us on Spreaker, like I said, and just keep supporting and downloading the show, and that will certainly help us out in the future. That's pretty much it, guys, and uh, make sure you haven't already to leave a question for next week's episode. You can do that on the Brendan Plays forums or in the YouTube comment section down below. Do it in this recent episode, so the latest episode of Let's Talk Tuesdays. Leave your questions there, or I won't see it. Or one of the better places to do it is on the forums as well. BrennanPlays.com forward slash forums. There will be a link to Let's Talk Tuesdays under under channel discussion, under the Brennan Place channel discussion. Or just go on there and knock somebody and they'll help you out. All right, that will do it for this week's edition of Let's Talk Tuesdays. Thanks, guys, for listening in, and I'll see you all next week.